TV public affairs presentation. For political observers like George Abbott and Paul Ramsey, it doesn't get any better than this. A new government, a new opposition, a new expanded opposition, the Green Party, and all within a short walk down to the BC Legislature where you can watch for free, in person, see all the battles going on, and watch history being made. Good evening and welcome to Voice of BC. I'm Vaughn Palmer. And yes, tonight on the show, we are going to take a look at the new government, the new opposition, the new partners in power sharing the Greens. And we have a couple of old friends of the show. Good to have them back on. George Abbott, thanks for being back. Good to see Pleasure you. Pleasure to be here. And Paul Ramsey, good to see you. And you are retiring from media punditry because you got yourself a job from the new government. <laughs> oh, my God. What are you doing? Gainful work. What are you doing? <laughs> Um, after having whined about the MSP premium system for two decades, the new government said to me and a couple uh, other academics, well, what should we do? And so we are Serves trying. you right. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're trying to sort that out for them. I mean, it's easy to make the announcement that you're going to eliminate uh, revenue to the government of some $2.6 billion a year and do it over your term of government. It's a little more difficult to figure how you fill that revenue hole. And there's clearly an expectation that you're not going to reduce the Ministry of Health budget by $2.5 billion, so you have to find alternate sources of revenue. And that's our challenge. And we have to come up with a coherent plan uh, to present uh, to government by the end of March. And, and the unusual thing about premiums is that some people pay them directly yes and other people they're pay, they're paid by their employer in a sense the employer yes. covers the cost and some people are in between but it's still reported as income yeah and then they just deduct it for you and pay it <clears throat> right so it, it is a very strange system on many many levels it's based on family income not personal income unique among the tax system personal uh, taxes in British Columbia it's this bizarre system or you have some exemptions. You can also get credits uh, for being a single parent or a variety of stuff. It is a totally, totally messed up system. And the thing that um, I think led both the new government oh, and the previous government to yeah. say we got to attack this is it's totally non-progressive. You pay the same amount of premiums whether you're earning $40,000 or $400,000. Yeah. Well, there's something that just doesn't sit right with We're that. We're the last province to have them. And That's so, We're the yeah. last province to have yeah. them. And all three parties in this province have done some version of saying, we got to get rid of these you things. you got a deadline? Yes. Okay. The end of March, uh, we are expected to produce a report uh, for the Minister of Finance. Okay. So not in the next budget, obviously, because that will be tabled in February. Um, and I think the government has already announced we're going down to 50% of those premiums as of January 1st. Right. They've, so they've That's already right. cut They've them. done that. Yeah. Now, <coughs> the hard still part got is the a hole time. to fill. Yeah. Yes. George Abbott, what have you been doing? Well, a couple of things, Vaughn. Uh, one, uh, I've been working with my, my colleagues, Bob DeFay and Chris Trumpy, on a project which is uh, hopefully going to bring uh, peace and love to the world of forestry relations between contractors and licensees. We've been engaged in that project now for about six months and uh, uh, we've concluded about 225 meetings across the province. Licensees are the ones that have the trees and the contractors are the ones who cut them down. Correct. You're okay. all over this. You could have been a part of our team, Vaughn, uh, with insights like that. That would have been, that would have been excellent. Uh, so we're, we're getting very close to, uh, to the writing stage. Uh, we've had a lot of great meetings and uh, I think even for us earnest amateurs, none of us are forestry professionals, but I think we're starting to understand a little bit about what could be done. So I do that and in my spare time I try to complete my dissertation so that I can become Dr. Abbott sometime in the future. BC history, right? Uh, uh, public policy more than history, but history is a part yeah. of it. Political science, history, public policy. Okay, well that's good. So gentlemen, I'm going to start you off with an easy one. <coughs> You're back in the cabinet room this month and you're facing what the Premier has called perhaps the toughest decision his government will face in this term, which is what the hell do you do about Site C? Tell me how, first of all, you think it'll 
be approached and then have a guess at what you think the outcome will be? Sure. Uh, well, I, there's, there's lots at play. This is a huge decision for the government and a very difficult decision for the government. They are pushed and pulled in all kinds of ways on this one. It's very tough. Uh, intuitively, I think uh, that the project will proceed. And I say that for a couple of reasons. One, I think uh, if, if they decide to, to end Site C, uh, it becomes a bad news story, not just for the first day, first week, but there would be continuing stories, I think, over, over one, two, three years as the, as the thing plays out. People being moving from employment to unemployment, uh, the loss of a major economic driver in the Northeast. Uh, but uh, if I was uh, John Horgan, and I think I understand a little bit about John Horgan's thought on this, he does not want to be uh, the object of a bunch of Dr. No criticism from the opposition benches uh, as being opposed to this project. I, m my gut uh, tells me it'll proceed, but I do have some substantial bets with smarter people who say it won't. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so you've uh, been there in cabinet rooms when tough decisions are made. This is probably going to take more than one meeting. I suspect this will be <clears throat> consuming cabinet between now and the new year. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they got to make it in the next couple of weeks. I mean, they want to get this out the door before Christmas, I would guess, which means they have a very limited time to go through it. I understand from you that they've recently gone back to the Utilities Commission and said, uh, we'd like a little more data before we make this. We'd like to know a little bit more about your projections on demand going out in the future. Uh, we'd like to know a little bit more about a whole range of things uh, that your report is based on and others may or may not have criticized. At the end of the day, I do not envy them. I mean, Mr. Horgan gets to step to the mic and say, we're proceeding. And, oh, and by the way, your electricity rates are going to go to this level in 2024. Or he gets to step to the mic and say, well, we're canceling it and writing off $4 billion and your electricity rates will go almost to the same level in 2024. So it is not an easy decision. Um, the environmental movement has done an excellent job of animating at least the public punditry on this issue. I'm not sure the general public is as seized as of this issue as that segment is. I would suspect that overall, this is sort of very much a second tier issue in people's minds as they evaluate governments and parties. Um, at the end of the day, I think I'm with George narrowly. You know, it, this, this could be one of those coin flips that land on its edge and you have to wait for it to fall. Uh, but on balance, I think we will see Site C proceeding. Yeah, I would say I've gone through an arc this fall from thinking, no, the, the, the cards are starting to be stacked against it as each revelation came along, the budget problems, the yeah. overrun, the <coughs> geotechnical issues. But I would say in the last, uh, particularly you mentioned those questions. So the government put a bunch of follow-up questions to the commission. They're all the kind of questions you would ask if you were looking for a reason to go ahead. Mm. They're not the mm -hmm. kind of questions you would ask if you were thinking of, of, of really of killing it because they're all... You know, are you sure you costed the implications of canceling it and what that'll do to rates? Is it true rates will go up 10%? Like, it's that kind of stuff. So I think they're the kind of questions that suggest the government is leaning toward going ahead, but we'll see. I don't think the government's made up its mind yet. I think the one thing I will say about the way John Horgan's handled this is I think he has tried to keep an open mind. I think he ran an open process, and I think it'll be a genuine debate at the cabinet table, and that's a good thing. I think it deserves that. Uh, let's go. We've got a bunch of questions for you on tape already, so let's go to some of those, and I'll come back to a couple of other things later. Let's start with uh, Maureen Karagiannis, and uh, an issue certainly that, uh, a bit of fallout, actually, from the election. Here she is. George and Paul, um, there is a, a growing divide between the urban and the rural parts of British Columbia, and that is really evident coming out of the last election, where we see... BC Liberals elected in so many rural seats and New Democrats elected in so many urban seats and Greens in urban seats as well. How do we ever bridge that? And do you think that this growing divide is going to be a problem going into the future? Mm. New Democrats certainly in the election decided to campaign where the votes were. They ran a very, very tough mm -hmm. campaign in Metro Vancouver, lost a couple of seats in the Northern Interior, yeah. but picked up 10. 
they clearly had a good analysis of where they could pick up seats and poured their resources and their leaders' time into those areas, and it worked. Um, and I regret to say that you know the seat I represented in Prince George and many other northern seats um, were simply not attainable by them. I'm not quite sure where the messaging and the attention to detail falls short. I'll give uh, the previous government full marks for presenting itself as the uh, government that wanted to build every pipeline, mine every uh, rock, cut down every tree, and appeal to the resource industries that the economies of the interior are based on. Um, and surely no, no NDP government's going to go that far. But there are lots of other issues in the North. Yeah. And the North now is not the North I represented. I mean, there's a tech industry in Prince George. I mean, there's a medical school in Prince George. They treat cancer patients in Prince George. It's changed. A university. And, a un and it's, it's vastly different. So you have a widening of what the economy is and the people that are living there. And I would have thought they were growing much closer to some of the issues of concerns of the big cities. But not so in uh, 2017. Rural urban divide. Sure. Well, I, I think, first of all, Maureen's uh, absolutely right that I think there is a fairly stark uh, rural urban divide, more so than prior to the election, and I think uh, more so than we've seen for a while. Uh, in part, it was a consequence, I think, of the quite shrewd campaign that John Horgan ran to try to pick up some of the seats that could swing in uh, uh, urban and suburban Vancouver, uh, the Burnaby seats in particular, and, and some of the Surrey seats. It was, uh, he, he ran a very good campaign. I think, as, as Paul mentioned, a very uh, targeted uh, campaign in terms of where they devoted their resources. Uh, I think, uh, again, uh, based on wh what I know of, of John Horgan, that he will be, uh, as the months roll ahead, uh, he will be looking to bring back in some of those rural seats. Uh, Columbia River Revelstoke, as an example, where it was kind of one, uh, it was a little bit of a weird situation why they lost that one, but for a variety of reasons, they lost a few of their hinterland seats that they had held uh, quite. Uh, uh, quite predictably for a long time. So I think John will devote some attention to try and bring some of those back into the NDP fold. He needs to, in fact, to to uh, secure a working majority, which, uh, again, I'm uh, certain, uh, given that every politician wants to have a working majority, he will try to do that, and he'll, he'll try to do that by swinging some of the traditional uh, NDP seats uh, in the interior uh, and in the north back into the, uh, in into the NDP camp. So, uh, in, in part, it is uh, uh, economic dynamics that, that Paul mentioned. It's also, uh, you know, a little bit like what used to happen in, in federal politics where uh, parties had uh, partisan sectionalism because they devoted their resources to winning certain ridings, and as a consequence, it started to look that way. Uh, there's a bit of that happening, but again, I think there'll be a concerted effort on, on the part of uh, all the parties to try to broaden their, their support across those divides. And I think one of the openings that he'll have is forestry, where mm -hmm. Shuka mm -hmm. had a horrible summer, obviously, because of the yeah. fires <clears throat> and the pine beetle. But uh, I think there's some openings there for, and again, it's, a, it's an area that Horgan knows and feels comfortable with. So I think you'll make some moves on that. Um, the next question is from somebody who has something in common with both of you. So let's go to the uh -oh. question. Here she, uh -oh. here she is, Elizabeth Cull. Uh, Paul and George, hello. Um, I've got a question for you as former health ministers. Uh, in 1991, the Seton Royal Commission came out with over 300 recommendations for what we could do to try to improve the health system in BC, and certainly it has improved since then, but so many of the key recommendations have let to, yet to be put into effect. Why is it taking so long to make the kind of changes that we know we need to make to health care in this province. Mm -hmm. Health wasn't a huge issue in the election, I don't think. Uh, transit and child care were much bigger, but uh, and it's now in the hands of Adrian Dix as health minister, who will be on the show later this month. But what's your what's your sense of what Elizabeth asked of, of where the 
the holdup and changes in healthcare. I know you did a, a large review of the healthcare system when you were minister. I know mm -hmm. that. <laughs> I, I did. Uh, I lived the dream of being a health minister for four years. Uh, in lots of ways, it seemed like four years. In other ways, it seemed like 40 years. Carried, um, carried the giant binder around? <laughs> yes, carried that giant binder around. It's uh, fascinating. Uh, I think uh, to, to answer Elizabeth's uh, important question, I think uh, the uh, I found, uh, and I suspect Paul may have found the same thing, but uh, health consumes now well over 40% of the provincial budget. It's huge. It's a, it's a huge organization that serves, I think, uh, over 100,000 people every day in some way uh, with you know, doctor's appointments or whatever it may happen to be. Uh, because it's such a large system, I think it tends to be intractable in terms of trying to move uh, public policy changes through uh, that, uh, that very large uh, structure. We have five regional health authorities, we have provincial health services authority, um, and, and I guess at core, we have a pretty great healthcare system too. It's not perfect by any means, but it's pretty darn good uh, relative to other systems in Canada and I think to much of the world. Uh, but but there's there there's lots of things to defend there, and whenever one proposes substantive changes to the system, there is invariably uh, a series of voices that will come back and say, "No, we prefer it that way." So it's it's just it's big. Uh, the issues are sensitive, they're emotional, and people are. I think sometimes rightly, uh, resistant to change because they're scared of change. Uh, health's very important to people and uh, for that reason it becomes a very, very difficult uh, ship to turn. You were both health minister and, and finance minister, so you know the, the you're taking half the budget argument from both sides of the fence. I got to spend it all and then I had to figure <laughs> out how to raise it. Yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting uh, on both sides of yeah. that. Um, I share many of George's and Elizabeth's perceptions. One of the things that I think goes on is that in debates around health care and reforming the system in ways that royal commission after royal commission after internal study mm -hmm. have shown need to get done, face enormous headwinds once you try to do them. Every commission that I've seen says the way we deliver primary care, you see your physician, is screwed up, doctors in a box. Everybody says you need clinic model with people on salary and a range of professionals. Man, but you run right into professional turf and money issues and all sorts of things when you try to do that fast. George made some progress. I made some progress. Current government, uh, last government made some progress. It's still not done. Drugs, huge issues uh, and potential cost savings to be made if you're willing to take on big pharma care and treat them like what they are, drug pushers that are worse than cocaine dealers. I but He said he was going to be controversial. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is very difficult to take them on because one of the things the drug companies do is they're excellent at animating patients, i.e. your voters, to oppose any cost savings that you might want to incur. Um, so you go through a lot of these things that the Royal Commission back in 91 said we should do, various Royal Commissions since then have said should do, but they are very difficult to do. And I'll add one more thing that I think screws things up. In the 70s, when we finally got Medicare as a, as a national program, the federal government got involved and they really, you know, were a co-partner. We haven't seen that in many cases since then. Um, and on things that you know need to get done, more resources into seniors' care, long-term care, end-of-life care, you need that push to get a system across the, the country. Drugs. Countries that have been successful in wrestling, not maybe wrestling pharma, care, uh, pharma to the mat, but at least having a decent battle with them, have national plans. We haven't had that leadership on the federal government around these issues. So I think it's both the inertia of butting against headwinds of interest groups and lack of leadership and partnership from the feds. Oh, very good. And as I said, we will have the health minister himself, Adrian Dix, on toward the end of the month. So we will put some of this to him as well. And we will take a brief break on Voice of BC. Stay with us. We will be right back.
Stop, stop. Don't flip that channel. Stay right here on Voice of BC. I'm Michelle Mungal, MLA Nelson Creston, and it's my favorite TV show. Everybody knows not to drink and drive, but some people still think it's okay to take drugs and drive. Police have the authority, the ability, and the tools to determine if drivers are impaired by legal or illegal drugs. And because drug-impaired drivers can pose just as great a risk as drunk drivers, they face the same penalties, like the loss of their driver's license, a criminal record, fines, and more. A message from the RCMP, the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, and Arrive Alive Drive Sober. There are more ways to connect with us at Voice of BC. Email us at vobc at shaw.ca. Follow us on Twitter at Voice of BC. Or like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash vobc on Shaw TV. Imagine a world with less bullying and more self-esteem. When a child has a mentor, their emotional, social, and physical health can increase dramatically. And when we have happy, healthy young people in our communities, everyone benefits. Right now, there are thousands of children waiting for someone to believe in them. Donate or volunteer for Big Brothers Big Sisters. Imagine who they'll become because of you. Visit imaginebbbs.ca. Presented with the generous support of Manulife. Hi, I'm Rich Coleman. We've got choices to make on watching television on Thursday nights. Voice of BC, or right now, Thursday Night Football. Thursday Night Football is okay. Voice of BC is way more fun and way more entertaining and way more fun to do, by the way. So watch Voice of BC. <laughs> Welcome oh. back. <laughs> Some of these are quite a bit of fun. We'll get you guys to do them uh, yeah. when we're done tonight. So, so um, a year from now, on this show, we're going to be talking about uh, the big, probably the results by then, of the big provincial referendum, a mail-in ballot on whether or not we want to change the electoral system. <clears throat> this will be the third time we've voted on this issue. And I guess the people who want to change the electoral system are kind of hoping it passes this time. Or they keep asking us the question until we get it right. But in any event, uh, let's talk a little bit about this. And let's start with a question from Andrew McLeod of the TIE. I'm wondering, as former politicians, how do you think that adopting a system of representation that is more proportional will affect politics in this province, if it goes ahead? You want to start? Sure. One of the things that I think could happen is we'll have more parties out there in the race. I have no crystal ball that says that the liberal conservative coalition that we've had in this province splinters back to liberal and conservative. I have no crystal ball. It might. It might. Yeah. I don't know whether the NDP coalition of greens and social activists and labors holds together or whether we have parties representing diverse things. In, in past years, uh, I think Canadians and British Columbians have tended to panic when faced with that. I don't think they ought to. What I see is if proportional representation goes ahead, and you do have, say, three or four parties that have significant uh, numbers of seats and coalitions have to be formed, what you really have is coalitions being done after the vote rather than when you're forming your parties. And inevitably, those coalitions, as the parties, will tend towards the middle of the political spectrum because that's where the support is. So I see a change in how we get to coalitions that are relatively left-center, right-center, but I'm not sure that the, the central policies and dynamics will change that much. BC Liberals are running pretty hard against this change and saying that depending on the system we get, and we don't know what systems are going to be offered, it could reduce representation in the north and interior of the province. Yeah, that would be uh, among the concerns, I think, that, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, I'm hearing from the B.C. Liberals. 
To go back to the original question, yep. uh, well, what do we have to see? First of all, British Columbia is not the only jurisdiction on the face of the earth that seems to have an endless fascination for rethinking its electoral system. Uh, New Zealand, uh, among others, has has been down this road, and I think the experience of New Zealand, which is very interesting, is just about exactly the same population size as British Columbia, and very much actually the same demographic mix as British Columbia. What we've seen in, in New Zealand uh, during their uh, experiment to date with, with the different electoral systems is a proliferation of smaller parties, and I think I agree with Paul that that's a likely outcome here in a in a PR system again depending what that PR system is uh, I think how I would respond to it and uh, I'm nonpartisan now but how I would respond to it uh, would be what's the character of the mix that is being proposed a pure PR system would definitely be a huge problem from a regional representation perspective uh, I, I'm not sure that that's what's going to be proposed uh, you know, uh, a German model where part are elected by by plurality, part by proportional representation might be another model that could be considered. Uh, the model that I probably comes close to what I would hope we'd look at is uh, one that was advocated by Ed Broadbent, uh, NDP federal leader, uh, some decades ago, which which is roughly two thirds, one third, two thirds elected by plurality, one third by proportional representation, and having the mix. Uh, the the um, uh, the uh, the first past the post system has its warts. It has its warts uh, sometimes in uh, dramatically overrepresenting the party that gets the largest number uh, of votes and greatly exaggerates that. As a consequence, sometimes people are underrepresented in the in the legislature that really need to be represented. I think a mixed model, and uh, you know whether it's three quarters, one quarter, or two thirds, mm -hmm. one third, or something. I think. Uh, might be a compromise that would work in in my mind. Uh, I wouldn't want the the balance to get too great though, because people do rely, and I think Paul and I are both sort of mm -hmm. hinterland uh, MLAs in our past. People do rely on the opportunity to go into their constituency yep. office in Prince George or Salmon Arm or Smithers or Vanderhoof and come and talk to the MLA. And if you don't have that regional connection, I think it's it's a it's mm. a big problem. Mm. Uh, the tough question. Um, comes from Jordan Bateman, and I'm going to get Paul Ramsey to answer this one. Paul, given current voter trend lines, and given the fact that the Greens are really reining in a lot of what the NDP would like to do in government, I'm very confused as to why so many NDP leaders support proportional representation. Don't they realize that this would virtually end their chances at ever having a majority government? That's a good question. And uh, when I was very active in the party um, and talking about proportional representation in the back rooms, there surely were people there who said, don't you dare go near proportional representation. Our only chance of forming government is when we hold our elements together and when the right wing splits. And you've heard that and repeated. That's true. And, and they formed three governments. Repeat, and they formed a grand total of three governments in what, 15 tries? Yeah. You know, so yeah. it hasn't been, well, if you look at that success record, maybe it's time to try something else hmm. and be part of a coalition that forms after an election rather than forms before an election. Uh, the reality is, as you know, I've heard political scientists in this province say forever, we don't have a right-wing party and a left-wing party. We have right-center, left-center, and if you actually have policies, they overlap a hell of a lot. Mm -hmm. they, <laughs> they really do. And so, you know, I'm less concerned about that, as I said in my initial mm -hmm. answer, of having decent policy that reflects the broad consensus of the population. So Jordan's right in that there certainly are elements within the NDP that have fought this idea forever. But I think there's also, particularly among the younger cadres in the party, looking and saying, okay, guys, you won three out of 15. Is that really enough success to get our policies implemented in the government? and in the province. Uh, George mentioned uh, New Zealand. New Zealand just got a new government uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Three parties united together, right? Germany, they're still negotiating. I think uh, they think it'll probably yeah. take three months or so to negotiate. So if you 
No, it took us a long time to get a government this year, so it's not unheard of under the current system. But uh, we'll be able to talk more about this. The government is planning a consultation. It will launch fairly soon. And that consultation will go out and discuss things like what are the actual questions going to be on the ballot? What are the options? How is it going to be run? Uh, so we'll know more later. At this point, we're speculating about what system it'll be because the government hasn't even told us what the options are going to be. Uh, let's go to this one. This was a, certainly been a controversy recently in the, the session involving the speaker. Here's Ida Chong. Given the controversy over the selection of a speaker when Christy Clark was premier for a short time, having to put forward one of her own members, and then when the NDP forming a minority government allowing for not one of their members to be brought forward as a speaker. Do you believe it's now time to rethink whether the speaker needs to be an MLA? Well, uh, there's certainly been controversy around the speaker this year. What do you think, George? Well, I'm, I'm not inclined to go the route of uh, a non-MLA a speaker. I think, you know, there's a, there's a tension that builds uh, as the question of who's going to be speaker and how's it going to affect the dynamics of the House. All of that is, uh, is exciting, but invariably a speaker is found. It's a pretty darn good job, actually. I never was a speaker, but I understand it's not a bad job. Uh, so they, they will find a speaker. Uh, I think, you know, looking back on on this, I think the the Liberal government in those early days after the 2017 election, if they'd thought this through and had actually provided a speaker to the uh, the NDP Green um, unit um, and and then uh, just uh, allowed them some runway and then pulled their support uh, when when they thought things were. Uh, were unraveling for the NDP government, that might have been a little different situation. Mm. Here they kind of got the worst of both worlds for, uh, for the Liberal side, um, but um, uh, obviously people made decisions and, and now the consequences are, are flowing. Give me your take on this flap over the Speaker banning uh, mock titles for cabinet ministers, a, a long-standing tradition in the BC House. He's now banned it. There are many things in question period that should probably be revised and revisited. I wouldn't put this one in the top 10, but it certainly, you know, reduces the tone of the government if you're making up scurrilous names for each other that way. You can figure out other ways of doing it, though, very easily. So, eh, okay. I think it's a, probably a, I put that in the plus column, uh, but not a huge game. The one thing... I would say, now I sit in the house every day for yep. Christ. I'm not watching it at home where you get the sound feed off the microphone. I'm sitting in the place trying to hear what people are saying over the heckling, which is unbelievable. Yeah. Normally, a government has to be around for a couple of years for it to get this bad. <clears throat> this is chaotic in there. He, it, it, if people think that by banning the name calling, the speaker changed the tone in the house. You can't mm -hmm. tell, right? In fact, if the only way I know if someone's called someone a name is if the speaker stops the proceedings and it gets quiet so you can hear. <laughs> you have to go read Hanser to find out what the hell they said. Yeah. So it's pretty wild in there. It's it's not, and it's not a happy place because the relationship between the speaker and the liberals is. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe with a change of leader in the new year, you'll get a you'll get a different tone, but uh, we may have to wait for that. Uh, speaking of change of leader in the Liberal Party, we've got a question from Jamie Lawson about that at UVic. Here he is. There was a point during the summer where I really thought that Premier Clark and her advisors had broken the Liberal Party. Uh, it was really about the throne speech, of course, and the way in which it really broke with the campaign promises and the, really the whole direction of the party in recent history. But now it seems that her position has been disavowed. She freed the party from it, and others who've stayed on have disavowed it as well. And rather than a big policy debate to smooth things over and choose a new direction, we're into a leadership campaign. Is that all it takes to restore health to this party that has been governing BC for some time now? Uh, do we have a healthy fish tank? in the form of the B.C. Liberal Party, 
Or is there a lot going on behind the scenes that we don't know about? I knew there was something fishy about the Liberal <laughs> Party, George. What do you think? How well, you? Uh, I'd say first of all that it is a it is certainly a healthier party than it was at the time of that uh, so-called throne speech, mm. uh, where uh, the, the the Liberal Party essentially uh, deserted much of what it had said in the platform and elsewhere and moved to. Uh, what was clearly an agenda purely designed to to remain in power. Uh, that I think was was a low point for the BC Liberal Party. Uh, they do have an opportunity to reinvent themselves now through the leadership process. I think the uh, BC Liberal Party has a pretty strong uh, uh, field of candidates to choose from. Uh, we will see. Uh, uh, again, I'm not a party member anymore, and I'm not involved in this. But I understand that no one has really sort of uh, set the. We, uh, we don't want to use forest fire analogies at this summer particularly, but no one's really set the the world on fire with with their rhetorical flourishes or anything like that. But I, I think a pretty strong field, uh, and they will have an opportunity to uh, build a new vision around a new leader. Uh, I'm presuming in the new year. Bill Tillman has a perfect question for you as uh -oh. a follow-up to that. Here's Bill. Paul, as a new Democrat, do you have any sense of who you'd prefer to see as the next liberal leader in terms of them losing, not winning, the next election? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, Bill. I really don't. And I haven't been paying very close attention to it. Um, I would suggest that uh, George is right. Part of it is for the Liberal Party was getting past that debacle of the last month of Christie Clark's government, which was really almost shameful mm -hmm. in the way they deserted everything. And just you could see all the fingernails digging into the wall trying to hold on to the position that they were. Um, I would also say that the world is changing around them. And if as I've seen in the past with the Socreds and the Liberals, they think they can just wait for the wait out the NDP. We're the national governing party in this province. Things will return to normal in uh, 2021 or whenever. I think they're making a mistake if they do that. I think the coalition stuff has changed the way things work. I think the urban-rural divide is more pronounced, as we said. Um, and I think proportional representation may well come. Yeah, add those up. I think they need a, a pretty serious rethink of how they position themselves in that sort of an environment. New leader will definitely help. I'm sure the troops will rally behind whoever it is, and they will be a well-organized party. But I think more needs to be done. And they may be uh, there for four years. Uh, the New Democrats have changed the date for the next provincial election. The House yep. has amended it. It'll be in the fall of 2021, so four years from now. And uh, the partnership at the moment between the Greens uh, and the NDP, despite a certain number of pillow fights between <laughs> between Andrew Weaver and anybody in the party who'll talk to him, uh, I think, uh, you know, at the moment, you don't want to say, having predicted that they would be lucky, to, the government would be lucky to last 100 days, uh, that it's here for four years, but uh, the Liberals may have some time to think this one over. They've, uh, there's a lot coming down the road. Um, I'm going to take a brief break on Voice of BC and come back and talk about some other issues with our guests tonight, so stay with us. Uh, we've still got some good questions on tape. Uh, we'll be back very soon. Thanks for watching. Vaughn, you're really going to have to help me out here. Paul Ramsey seems like a thoroughly decent, very intelligent, wonderfully kind human being. How on earth did he end up in BC politics? Can you ask him, did he fall and bump his head in 1991? I remember Paul because we were uh, in the house together and in cabinet together and I have to say he was one of the most uh, considerate and level-headed uh, people that I got to work with. He was always thoughtful, looked at all sides of the issues, made good decisions, and treated people really well. So I loved working with Paul. Uh, after I was out of politics and uh, Paul was uh, in portfolios that I'd held, health and, uh, and finance, it was always great to get together with him and talk about the trials and tribulations of uh, working through those portfolios. 
uh, to the point where at some point, Paul, you'll remember this, we had the ex-health and finance ministers club, a group of us that had all held those portfolios at some point, and we'd get together and talk about how we would run the world if we were back doing it. Uh, Paul, you've just done a great job over the years. I've loved watching you on uh, Voice of BC. So uh, enjoy your retirement, enjoy your farm and your family, your grandkids, and uh, good for you. Paul, you must feel that you have had a very distinguished career in BC politics because you have served in many significant and important portfolios. And I can say that each and every time that I have the opportunity to debate with you, whether it's ministerial issues or whether it's legislation, you showed me nothing but respect and courtesy. You have been a true gentleman, and I want to thank you for that. And I do want to wish you well as you journey on a new path on your road to semi-retirement. Working with Paul Ramsey in the late 1990s when we were in government was a great experience. I found that Paul was always very sensible, had a really good approach to public policy, and was a very thoughtful politician. So uh, in the years since then, of course, it's been a great advantage to have known him and to often draw on some of his wisdom, his thoughtfulness. Um, with Paul retiring, I think it leaves a great gap in the kind of real public policy discussions that need to take place in British Columbia now and into the future. So uh, I have great admiration for Paul. I've learned a lot from him as a politician and as a friend, as a new Democrat. So uh, congratulations, Paul, on your retirement. I hope that it's successful. I suspect people will still keep coming to you for advice, though. Paul Ramsey retiring from political punditry? That makes no sense to me at all. I get retiring from politics. He and George Abbott look so much better since they weren't in the cabinet with all the worries and stress that has. But punditry is fun. It's enjoyable. And it doesn't matter what you say because you're not held accountable anyway. Paul, reconsider. Oh, I remember that. Uh, well, that was sort of oh. nice. Uh, so we had a nice tribute to you. And I will thank, thank you, you very much. much for coming on the show. and. George is staying, so uh, uh, we don't have to do the retirement thing for him yet. But seriously, mm. former politicians, particularly ones who've held big jobs like you did in finance and in health, to come on and just tell people what they need to know to understand how decisions are made in government. Like, it's a real asset to shows like this. And I very much appreciate all the contributions you've made. And if after you've finished uh, doing this job for the government and sorted all that out and everybody in BC doesn't hate you for whatever you recommend, we'd be delighted to see you back on again. We've got, uh, because you were on and, and uh, George as well, we have some good questions taped uh, from uh, somebody else who used to be on a panel on this show before he retired. Mm -hmm. Bob Plekis, oh, here he Bob. is. Good. Well, first, congratulations, Paul, on retiring from public commentary. It, there is life after it, I can assure you. But here's a question for you. It starts like this. Harcourt, Clark, Miller, Dosange. You served with four premiers. Can you just go through them and give us their strengths and weaknesses, maybe one point each? And then afterwards, you and George can talk about just what makes a good premier. Hmm. Well, what makes a good premier? Very interesting. I mean... I don't, that was a strange period in BC politics. When I got elected in 91, I had no inclination I'd be serving under four different premiers. Okay. That, that was bizarre. Um, and what really originally got me into politics was Mike Harcourt. I liked his approach to politics. I'd been following politics in BC for a couple of decades since I moved here. Uh, but Mike's approach, trying to sort of blunt some of the rabidness of it, and present sensible things really appealed to me. And so I joined a party. I wasn't a member of the NDP until 1990. And then ran for government and ended up a few years later in cabinet. Um, Mike's strength was that. He gave people space. That was also his weakness. He let people run a little too freely at times. And you remember the first year and a half of his government, it was a bit of this horse going that way and that horse going this yeah. way and who the hell's driving the chariot. Uh, and so 
know, that was his weakness. His strength was, though, I thought he, he connected with people just wonderfully. Yeah. I mean, you, I could talk to right-wing businessmen in Prince George and never vote NDP in their life. And they thought Mike Harkett was just a great fellow. Yeah. Um, Glenn is probably the, the smartest po uh, premier I worked with. By God, he could understand an issue. Um, he knew more about issues than the, than the bureaucrats did at times. He was a, the quickest study, really knew things, um, and really had a sense of where he thought he could draw lines and get uh, political advantage. Sometimes he was right, sometimes he was wrong. Um, <laughs> weakness, um, if Mike held the reins a little too loose, Glenn held them a little too tightly. That's interesting. You really did. Yeah. What's your take? What makes a good premium? Well, again, it's uh, it's striving to find that uh, that that perfect balance. Uh, you know, I've been thinking about this because I'm writing my dissertation on that 2001-2005 period. Mm. Um, you know, the, the the plus for Gordon Campbell was he had an endless fascination for for public policy and uh, utilizing public policy as levers to exact change. Uh, I think uh, at times uh, he he was. Uh, some some people would say he was resolutely determined. Other people would say he was utterly bullheaded, uh, and uh, at times he was probably both. Uh, but uh, but I would never take away from him his interest in public policy, particularly after that 2001 to 2005 period. He was quite a different uh, premier when we had money to spend than when. Uh, uh, we were going through, uh, as we did in 2009, oh. the economic recession. Uh, he intuitively would would look to do deep cuts to try to to meet that, but but was pretty uh, pretty imaginative, pretty creative at times when we had money. So. You want, if you're going to be in a Gordon Campbell cabinet, you want to be in there when you have some money because it's <laughs> way more fun than the retrenchment period. It's interesting. I saw a piece in the Global Mail this week by Ian Bailey. Uh, a group of academics have produced an entire book on the Gordon Campbell government, 15 long sort of academic articles on different things mm -hmm. the Campbell government did. And one of the questions that the Bailey from the Globe asked them was, could they imagine other doing that, a book, kind of book about other BC premiers. And of course, one of the things they pointed out is most BC premiers don't last long enough <laughs> to, to <laughs> effect a revolution. Campbell was premier for 10 yeah. years, there's only three yeah. or four in the whole history of the province have lasted that long. I tell people I've, I've covered 10 premiers in the 33 years I've been doing this job, one every three years, but I'll tell Horgan when he's on next week, <laughs> it's just an average, it's not a prediction, right? So. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, it, it's interesting about Campbell. I, I, I've got two more questions on tape that I want to get to. And one, one of them, the first one, is from one of the premiers you served. So here's Dan Miller. Really, my question to Paul is, I'm wondering how he feels after all these years. Uh, I made a switch and made him Minister of Finance uh, when I was premier back in 1999-2000. Uh, uh, my impression was that he flourished there, that brought in some balanced budgets, and... Uh, I'm wondering what Paul's reflection on that time might be. And we won't hmm. tell anybody who you replaced as finance minister. <laughs> trivia fans, guess. <laughs> yeah. that, that is a bit of BC trivia that few yeah. will get right. Yeah. Um, the Ministry of Finance was probably the most all-consuming portfolio, but I would say it gave me the broadest understanding of how government works uh, of any of the portfolios. Because um, you have to poke your little finger into every little program and understand whether you're, what you're being presented with as a request for increases or demand for cuts is real or some fictitious thing made up. Um, and you also have to be very aware of uh, what's going on all around the province. I think I had an advantage in that because I'd held the two biggest social portfolios, health and education. And I'd been out around looking at all areas of the province, visiting hospitals and schools and universities and whatever. And it really gave me a, a, an excellent background in how communities and economies worked in all corners of BC. And that really, really helped me uh, when I became finance minister. 
And for those of you who browse through old copies of the audited financial statements of British Columbia, Dan Miller is not making it up. Paul Ramsey presented two budgets. One was balanced on a razor's edge, but it was balanced, and the other one was, what, a billion-dollar surplus? A billion audited. and a half. It was a the largest surplus in the province's history yeah. at the time. So it can be done, and it was done by Paul Ramsey. Uh, what's what's your take? You weren't finance minister, but no. uh, and and I know I've I've been in a room while you did one of these presentations to people on how you approach government. One of the things that I've often thought is for people that are looking for something from government, like imagine yourself making a presentation to the staff in the Ministry of Finance for why you should get the money as opposed to somebody else, right? Because that's sort of what it comes down to in government, right? Yeah, well, uh, I was I was never a member of Treasury Board, but I felt uh, as a, as an education minister and a, uh, and as a health minister that I was kind of like an honorary member of Treasury Board because I used to go there so often and get ritually beaten so often uh, <laughs> when I entered. I've written a children's book called Curious George Goes to to Treasury Board, which kind of captures a lot of that uh, you know those dunce cap moments. Uh, when uh, when uh, I was able to understand that uh, I really could do more with less, and that uh, yes, the, the finance minister does know better than than others. Uh, I'm being a bit harsh here. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate. Uh, no, it's, uh, finance ministers are hugely important, and 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 they do try to balance out the many competing demands uh, that they face. So you know, it's uh, w when you get to be health minister and you're you're living that dream. 18 hours a day and issues are coming at you at a million miles an hour, you kind of forget that there are other ministries of government and that someone has to actually coordinate it and that's, and that's, uh, that's finance and, and Treasury Board. So as we speak, going on here in the provincial capital starting this week is the Treasury Board process, which is a, <clears throat> the name gets mixed up sometimes. It's a committee of cabinet. It is also a staff in the Ministry of Finance that asks all the tough questions about spending decisions. All the ministers put together what they want, and then they start going through the process, and that started this week. I, I asked Carol James, finance minister, when it was starting, and she said, well, it's starting this week, and uh, we'll be busy for a while. I said, you'll be making lots of friends. She <laughs> said, yes, so it's a good thing I have a thick skin, because the finance minister ends up saying no. And this lot. government has been out of power for 16 years, yeah. so imagine how much there is in the way of pent-up expectations. That whole process... We'll deliver a budget to uh, British Columbia. I think it's the 19th of February, the third week in February. So we'll see how it all comes out. It'll be the first full-blown budget under the NDP. We have a little bit of time left and another good question from Bob Plekas. So here he is. As you wrap up your career and you look back at it, I know I did, of all the things that you managed to accomplish, and they were significant because you were a significant minister, can you just give us your personal view of those one or two things that were really important to you. And those kinds of things that may be a big thing that changed the life of many in the province, or just maybe one person. Can you just reflect on that? And maybe, George, you can as well. Because I think when you think back, those are the memories that are important. Um, one of the things that I reflect on is there are very, I mean, like George, I probably introduced a couple dozen, maybe more pieces of legislation uh, that will affect the province, well, continue to affect the province. There are only two that I framed and hung on my office wall. Okay. The Budget Transparency and Accountability Act, which changed the way budgets and accountability are done in British Columbia and blew away all the shenanigans that made the disaster of 96 possible and had been manipulated by governments for decades before that. The world changed, accounting got straightened out, and people understood that they had to actually toe the line. Um, I remember delivering a signed copy of that to the Auditor General and thanking him for his report that prodded government into finally doing this. It and was one thing that landed on my desk. I surely didn't plan it, but it had to get done. And I think that piece of legislation did most of what it was supposed to. When I started yep. covering provincial budgets, the budget lockup <coughs> was invariably a giant argument 
between the press gallery and the experts and the finance ministry over what was the real deficit yep. and what was the real bottom line and all this stuff that had been moved around. There's still stuff goes on that could yes. be improved, but you're right, that worked. What was the other one? The Access to Abortion Services Act, huh. called the Bubble Zone Legislation. When I became Minister of Health in the fall of 93, it was war outside the abortion clinics in British Columbia. People were getting beat up. Staff were in fear of their lives. Dr. Ramallis had been shot by a sniper, and I feared it was going to go the way it has continues to go in the States. Right. Um, with this one small medical procedure blowing up into something that would tear communities apart. Um, and I, you know, looked around and saw that this very idea of just making people back off from getting in each other's face, where the services were delivered and where people lived, could cool things out. It was challenged almost in instantly, of course, uh, by the anti-abortion forces, and eventually it was all the way to the Supreme Court, where it was yep. upheld and remains the law of the land. And you may have seen in this province, we have huh. not had that blow up on this issue since then. Have in other jurisdictions, but not BC. Those are good examples. George, mm -hmm. what well, do you remember tough. most about your time in government? Well, it's, it's a tough question to answer because I loved all the ministries and I loved all the senior public servants that I had the honor of working with over, over a dozen years. I would say, though, my favorite time was uh, Ministry of Education, the last mm -hmm. portfolio folio I held, you know, despite it being punctuated by some, some uh, labor disputes. It was, uh, it was a great time because uh, I was a very experienced politician. Uh, the ministry had a deep and well-articulated agenda that they that they wanted to pursue, uh, and uh, the premier, Premier Clark, to her credit, uh, let me do and let the ministry do what uh, what we wanted to do in a bunch of areas. So it was a great time, lots of good stuff moving through. Uh, in terms of uh, you know the highlights, and there's lots of highlights over a long career, but. Uh, the, the, uh, the BC Teachers Council, uh, mm -hmm. the first thing that was presented on my desk after election, or a after uh, reappointment as uh, education minister, was Don Avison's report on the, on the teachers, uh, count or te not teachers council, college. college. And, uh, and so we spent a lot of face time, about 30 hours face time with the BC Teachers Federation, working through what they needed from, um, uh, either the college or the council, as it became renamed, uh, and and it was a great process. A lot of people involved, in addition to the BC Teachers Federation, and the result was a uh, a, a, a statute, uh, which eventually became uh, uh, universally adopted in the house. So that was uh, that was a really good moment for me. I think we got time for one more question. It's the president of the press gallery, Tom Fletcher, and I want to hear what George thinks on this one. So let's go to Tom. George, the BC Treaty Commission, uh, you were uh, getting ready to chair that uh, busy operation at one point. Um, that didn't happen. Uh, but now we have a government in Ottawa that has created an entirely new uh, department in order to deal with the relationship with Indigenous people and with treaties. Uh, to me, that sounds like another way to spend a lot more borrowed money but maybe you could tell me what you think about that. Is it going to help? And um, is it going to hinder? Uh, George, we leave no wounds unsalted on this show, right? We're <laughs> yes. going to bring that old story up again yes, about how yes, you yes. almost became head of the Treaty Commission. Yes, thank What's you for that. What's your take on where we're headed on this? So uh, I'd say a quick We've got about a minute. About a minute. So, uh, first of all, I think that the changes in Ottawa, I hope they yield something, but I don't think what they've done, there's a lot of hard work that needs to be done before there's going to be substantive results from that. Uh, there are some challenges to the Treaty Commission right now, among them the expectations created by the Silcatine decision in the Supreme Court of Canada, the uh, United Nations Declaration of the Rights of uh, Indigenous Peoples, that needs to work through. I think there's a few things that are working against the treaty process, but I am absolutely supportive of it. Uh, I hope that Celeste has great success in concluding some treaties, because I think it's hugely important that uh, we give uh, first 
First Nations the opportunities to, to work down those uh, various paths where they can uh, enjoy greater opportunities for reconciliation and advancement in this, in this province. Mm. Thank you, George, for that. And Paul, thanks for being on the show and uh, good luck in the big decision the government's uh, given Thank you, you. to, uh, to uh, make. Uh, thanks for everything you've done for the show. Thanks for watching Voice of BC, bringing the legislature, BC politics into your living room. Next week, the guest is John Hort and the Premier of British Columbia. Stay with us. Good night. The following is a community access program. While this program does not necessarily reflect the views of Shaw or its employees, Shaw is proud to support local producers and share local voice.